When it comes to weapons in D&D, we have a plethora of options available, from the simple club to the mighty great axe. However, the rule books don't provide us much detail on these weapons, leaving us to fill in the gaps of how our weapon looks and feels with our own imagination. Due to this lack of information, I'd like to go through and examine the weapons of D&D to foster a deeper understanding of what they truly are. Over the course of this video, we'll seek to answer what is this weapon, both in history and in D&D, how is it different from the other weapons available, and does it need to be made better, and how can we do so? For today's topic, let's look at a rogue's favorite tool of the trade, the dagger. The definition of a dagger can get a bit muddy, so let me clear up a few things right off the bat. Firstly, a dagger is a type of knife. I know, groundbreaking discovery. But the proper usage of terms is important to keep things from getting too confusing. Not all knives are going to be daggers, but all daggers are a type of knife. Specifically, a dagger is a fighting knife with a blade shorter than 30 centimeters, a sharply tapered point, a central spine or fuller, and usually two cutting edges that are sharpened along the full length of the blade. Most also feature a full cross guard to keep the user's hand protected from their opponent. The dagger's design makes it useful for stabbing or slashing, though many fighting styles emphasize it as a thrusting weapon. At first glance, the dagger is a very straightforward weapon, simply a sharpened blade at the end of a handle. However, simplicity does not make a weapon any less harmless. While the shorter blade of a dagger may leave smaller wounds, their nimble size allows the user to strike very quickly. Against armored enemies, daggers were also used to finish off an opponent, as they were easy to squeeze between the gaps of various types of medium and heavy armor. Daggers themselves have been around since the Neolithic Age, consisting of materials like bone, flint, and ivory. As humanity progressed into the Bronze Age and the Third Millennium, daggers made out of copper or bronze began to appear in areas like pre-dynastic Egypt. Across the Mediterranean, in the region of Iberia, blacksmiths were able to produce high-quality iron daggers, likely a result of having access to more pure iron and sophisticated forging methods. These superior Iberian daggers were quickly adopted by Hannibal's Carthaginian armies, and later by the Romans, who began conquering the peninsula in the 200s BC. During the later Roman Empire, the Romans were inspired by the design of Iberian daggers and made their own, issuing its legionaries the Pugio, a double-edged iron thrusting dagger with a blade measuring 17 to 30 centimeters in length. The Pugio was considered a legionnaire's last line of defense, and was used most often as a thrusting weapon in close quarters combat, though it also served as a convenient utility knife when on the march. After the fall of the Roman Empire, historical accounts see the term dagger disappear. It's believed that this reflects how the dagger was replaced by the Celtic sax in the early Middle Ages, which was more like a knife than a dagger. Reappearing in the 12th century as the knightly dagger, it was developed into a common weapon and tool for civilian use by the late medieval period. Outside of Europe, small daggers had a similar trend of working as military weapons in antiquity, then moving to a sidearm or backup role in the later medieval eras. The Japanese Tonto, for example, was a small dagger worn by samurai as a backup weapon before the popularization of the Wakazashi short sword. Another example would be the Okinawan Sai, which may have actually originated its design in India, Thailand, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, or even Indonesia. The Sai was a three-pronged stabbing weapon commonly used by police for crowd control, though it was also prevalent in martial arts and ninjutsu. In modern times, the dagger has remained a prominent military weapon, being standard issue as a close combat weapon, 
as well as a bayonet attachment on the end of service rifles. Outside of the military, certain martial arts like Filipino escrima, Japanese tanto jutsu, and hima still practice dagger combat. Civilian usage of the dagger, however, is heavily restricted in various countries, with knife legislation restricting the size and usage of daggers the public can carry. Despite only weighing around half a kilogram, most daggers are actually not meant to be thrown, and can't be used effectively as a throwing weapon. Throwing knives are considered an entirely different type of knife, with a specific design and weight distribution to make them usable. Now, does that mean you can't throw a dagger and do some damage to someone? No, but that's not a dagger's intended use. Speaking of intended uses, this is the part where I get to burst some bubbles regarding dual wielding. Historically, dual wielding was documented in certain instances, but not in the way that we think of today. While records of dual wielding in war are limited, there are some martial arts that involve the use of a pair of weapons. Historical European martial arts, for example, often practice fencing and sword fighting with a parrying dagger in the offhand. However, medieval fighting manuals almost never show someone wielding a dagger in both hands. In actual combat, weapon reach is a very important factor, and in a one-on-one -on -one fight, the person with the longer weapon has a big advantage over their opponent. So, while there is historical evidence that daggers were dual wielded in some instances, they were more often used as an offhand weapon alongside a rapier or arming sword. In D&D, daggers are described as short, two-sided blades used for stabbing and thrusting, which are shorter than a short sword, but longer than a knife. Their appearance and material could vary depending on who created it, potentially being made out of iron or steel, bone, stone, or even coral. The dagger's stats have varied slightly across the different editions of D&D, with a standard dagger costing between 1 and 2 gold pieces, weighing half a kilogram, and dealing 1d4 piercing or slashing damage. In previous editions, there were also other variants of daggers, such as the stone or bone daggers in 2nd edition, the punching dagger in 3rd edition, and the parrying dagger in 4th edition. In 5th edition, the dagger costs 2 gold pieces, weighs half a kilogram, deals 1d4 piercing damage, and has the finesse, light, and thrown weapon properties. Compared to the other simple weapons, the dagger in 5th edition has a lot of weapon properties that allow it to be used in various ways. The finesse property allows the user to add either their dexterity or strength when making attacks, giving dexterity-based classes a good simple weapon to use while not restricting it from strength-based classes. The light property allows the dagger to be used in two-weapon fighting meaning that if an attack action is made with a light melee weapon held in one hand, the wielder can use their bonus action to attack with a different light melee weapon being held in the other hand. Finally, the thrown weapon property allows the dagger to be effectively thrown with a normal range of 20 feet and a long range of 60 feet. With all these properties together, you can see why some classes prefer using daggers, as you can use them on dexterity heavy classes, dual wield them or pair them with another light weapon, and even throw them at enemies who are a moderate distance away. The dagger initially appears as a jack of all trades weapon, being usable by every class as either a primary or backup weapon. That being said, as a jack of all trades, it does sit as a master of none. The dagger's dual wielding capabilities fall short compared to hand axes, short swords, or scimitars, as its low damage can be outdone rather easily given the right proficiencies. As a thrown weapon, it's on equal footing with the dart, a simple ranged weapon, but comes at 40 times the gold cost. At later levels, this might not matter 
but in low-level games, that gold could easily be spent on other, more important pieces of equipment. Finally, as the only simple melee weapon with the finesse property, it's really the only choice for classes that don't have proficiency with finesse martial weapons. However, every dexterity-based class that would need a finesse weapon starts at level 1 with proficiency in better finesse melee weapons, such as the scimitar, short sword, or rapier. As a result, we're left with a weapon that is either objectively worse than other available options, or a last resort for caster classes that don't use weapons anyways. Looking at the dagger in this light, it can seem mechanically underwhelming compared to our other weapon options. But the dagger can still bring a lot of roleplay flavor to our characters. Perhaps we want to play the sneaky rogue, silently stabbing people in the back to clear the way forward for the rest of the party. Or maybe we want to build a character whose preferred method of attack is throwing daggers. So how can we make the dagger a bit more viable so that these types of characters can still be useful when initiative is rolled? Well, my first suggestion would be to restore the dagger's improved critical hit effects from 3rd edition D&D. In 3rd edition, there were two types of dagger. A regular dagger, which dealt 1d4 piercing or slashing damage and could be thrown 10 feet. As well as a punching dagger, which only dealt 1d4 piercing damage and could not be thrown. Despite only doing 1d4 damage, the regular dagger could critically strike on a natural 19 or 20, whereas the punching dagger only critted on a natural 20, but when it did crit, it did triple damage instead of double. Having each of these as weapon options meant that players could choose whether they wanted to critically strike more often or do more damage when they do crit. This gave the dagger a role within crit fishing builds, where the player focused on critically striking to do a lot of damage, instead of just wielding the strongest weapon that they could. If the dagger in 5th edition were given either of these effects, or if the punching dagger were to make a return as an alternate dagger option, they would immediately become more viable weapons for specific classes and builds, such as an assassin rogue that wants to stack sneak attack damage onto their critical strikes, a gloomstalker ranger who uses better criticals to end fights before they begin, or even a champion fighter who uses their superior criticals to deal triple damage on their attacks. Another suggestion to make the dagger more viable in 5th edition is to add Pathfinder 2nd Edition's expanded critical effect of persistent bleed damage. In Pathfinder, when a critical strike is rolled with a weapon, that weapon's group adds an additional effect onto the attack. For knives, which includes daggers, this effect deals 1d6 bleeding damage at the end of the affected creature's turns for as long as the creature has the bleeding condition, which is typically around 1 minute. This gives the dagger an added damage debuff to put on enemies that can help whittle down tougher opponents, but it only occurs on critical strikes, so dagger wielders won't be able to cheese tough fights by stacking bleed. Plus, if this suggestion was added alongside the better critical suggestion, this adds an additional benefit for players who wield daggers as part of their crit fishing build. The final suggestion I'd like to put forward to make the dagger better is to allow the dagger to swap between piercing or slashing damage, as they can in 3rd edition D&D and Pathfinder 2nd edition. This reflects the dagger's ability to slash or pierce depending on how the attack is made, and against monsters that are either vulnerable, resistant, or immune to slashing or piercing damage, allows the user to swap their damage type on the fly and adapt to their enemies. As I stated in the short sword video, which had this same suggestion, the downside to this is that many monsters in 5th edition don't come with a lot of these resistances, vulnerabilities, and immunities, 
so dungeon masters would also have to tweak existing monsters to make choosing between damage types actually matter in-game. These are just a few of my own suggestions on how to make the dagger better in 5th edition. If any of these changes were implemented, the dagger could go from being an underwhelming backup option to being a deliberate choice for characters who want to focus on a specific playstyle, all while not overshadowing other weapon options. This lets players tailor their gameplay experience to fit their roleplay experience, all while remaining a valuable and effective party member in combat. With that, we come to the end of today's video on the dagger. A tool for many trades, the dagger's current position as an easily usable backup weapon leaves a lot to be desired from those who find them fun. With a few tweaks to how they interact with critical strikes, I believe the dagger can fall more into a specific combat role that benefits more playstyle and roleplay choices than it does currently. However, Many might say that the dagger should just stay where it's at, as some weapons just need to be worse than others in the game. But what do you think? Do you like these alternate options for the dagger? Did you have something else in mind that you think would make it more viable? Or do you think the dagger is fine where it's at? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. If you'd like more deep dives into the weapons of D&D, make sure to let me know with a like or comment. You can also find links to the Altworld Discord server and our Kofi page in the description. So if you'd like to learn more about D&D or help support us here, you can check out those links as well. That's all I had for today though. So thank you all for watching. Make sure to have a great rest of your day and I'll see all of you next time.